Welcome. In this episode, we're going to take a look at some natural oil seeps in the state of California. We'll visit oil regions ranging from Los Angeles in Southern California, all the way up to Humboldt County in Northern California along the Lost Coast. We'll also take a look at the very early days of the California oil industry. Also, we'll take a look at the science of how oil forms underground in the earth, how it migrates underground in the earth, and how it accumulates in things like sandstone formations to become oil reservoirs. The USGS and other government agencies maintain an inventory of the location and the nature of various oil and gas seeps around California. For the data set mapped here, the green locations are oil seeps and the red locations are gas seeps. The La Brea tar pits are located in a highly urbanized section of Los Angeles. Some seeps along the beach in Santa Barbara County were found at Tar Pits Park in the city of Carpinteria. Two different seep areas were visited in Ventura County. The first stop was in the Bear Canyon area of the Cesar Creek drainage. The second stop in Ventura County was further along Highway 150 where Cesar Creek runs into Santa Paula Creek. Two seep visits were made in Kern County. The first one was at a seep just to the southeast of the town of Maricopa. The second seep stop in Kern County was at a spot just to the southwest of the town of McKittrick. From Kern County, we moved on to some seeps in Northern California. The first stop was in the area of Wilbur Hot Springs, roughly 25 miles southwest from the city of Calusa in Calusa County. While we were in Calusa County, we discovered an unmapped seep along the side of Highway 20. The next seep visited was coming out of a cliff along a beach near a pier in the town of Point Arena in Mendocino County. The final seep location that was visited was the southern part of Humboldt County. The visit included a stop in the town of Petrolia along the Matol River. The natural oil seeps along the side of Ojai Road in Ventura County are very easy to spot. Beginning about eight miles to the east of Ojai, in the Bear Valley portion of the Cesar Creek drainage. A substantial volume of oil could be seen running directly out of the hillsides and into the drainage ditch along the side of Ojai Road. California's oil seeps like this have been known to Native Americans for thousands of years. 250 years ago, California's oil seeps started becoming known to European settlers during the Spanish colonial period. Following the gold rush in 1849, when a huge wave of people came to California, most of California's remaining undiscovered oil seeps became discovered. The new settlers crisscrossed the state looking for places to establish new livelihoods. Areas were explored for mineral resources, places to establish ranches, and or places to establish new farms. The following clips show various oil seeps running directly into Santa Paula Creek from the area just below the Cesar Creek Bridge. The views are from Highway 150, downstream from a location 
known as Sulphur Springs. Tar Pits Park in the city of Carpinteria has heavy oil running directly out the side of the cliffs and over the sand along the beach. The asphalt deposit at this location is very rich and about 125 years ago the Alcatraz Asphalt Company had a large plant at this location where tar was mined and mixed with sand to create asphalt for paving sidewalks. Located on busy Wilshire Boulevard in downtown Los Angeles, the La Brea Tar Pits are California's most famous oil seat. The museum is very impressive, and for those who have never been, a visit is highly recommended. The La Brea Tar Pits is a registered national natural landmark. Scientists have determined that the tar pits have been active for tens of thousands of years. The tar pits trapped a wide variety of prehistoric animals, including mammoths, dire wolves, short-faced bears, American lions, ground sloths, and saber-toothed cats. Skeletons from all of these animals are on display in the museum. The large, iconic lake pit located in front of the museum is actually a pit left over from asphalt mining operations in the late 1800s. Rain and groundwater collected above the bubbling asphalt, creating a small lake. The lake's bubbles, sheet, and distinctive odor come from a deep underground oil field. It includes a recreation of a mammoth becoming trapped in tar. Over the last 125 years, over 100 fossil quarries, commonly called pits, have been excavated. Important fossils continue to be recovered from some of the pits, as shown in the video here. To date, over 1 million bones have been recovered. The tar pits do not contain any dinosaur bones because during the time of the dinosaurs, Los Angeles was under the ocean. Although there is no activity today, the oil seep near Maricopa contains traces of a commercial fossil quarry that was operated a few years back. And going much further back to the late 1800s, the oil seep near Maricopa was the site of a early asphalt mining and mixing operation. Additional seeps can be found in this area running east-west in the foothills of the San Amigdio Mountains where the oil sands outcrop. This fairly active and gassy oil seep is located about one mile to the southwest of the town of McKittrick along Highway 58. The natural asphalt deposits in this area are very rich. In 1893, the Southern Pacific Railroad connected McKittrick to Bakersfield with a new railroad line to allow mined asphalt to be transported up to San Francisco to pave the streets. Similar to the La Brea tar pits, many prehistoric animals were trapped in these tar deposits as well. Many fossils were excavated by scientists between 1928 and 1949. A large oil deposit can be seen directly north of the Point Arena fishing pier in Point Arena in Mendocino County. Looking at the steep cliff directly above the beach, the presence of the oil in the outcrop is unmistakable. The oil accumulation seems to be concentrated within one particular layer within the geological outcrop. Although the oil outcrop in the cliff is fairly massive, the amount of oil that's actually seeping out of the cliff is fairly small. The reason for the small amount of seeping oil is likely because it's fairly heavy and it probably does not have much dissolved gas in it.
In any case, it's a very scenic location to look at an oil seat. Wilbur Hot Springs is located at the end of a gravel road about four miles north of Highway 20. Unfortunately, Wilbur Hot Springs itself is located on private property behind a locked gate. Many oil and gas seeps have been mapped in this area. The oil and gas seeps in the area of Wilbur Springs were mentioned in an ad from 1870, which mentioned that some of the oil and gas seeps had been burning uninterruptedly for years. None of the oil and gas seeps in the area of Wilbur Hot Springs could be visited directly because they reside on private property behind fences. However, this geological outcrop along Sulphur Creek beside Wilbur Springs Road shows the marine geology that contributes to the formation and the migration of the oil and gas seeps in the area. On the hill above Wilbur Springs Road, there appeared to be a small seep based on the small dome feature and the green plants kept alive by water. On private property north of Wilbur Hot Springs and viewed from Bear Valley Road, there appears to be one or more old well locations and or seeps. This unmapped seep was located directly adjacent to Highway 20, roughly two miles to the southeast of Wilbur Hot Springs. A steady stream of water could be seen flowing from the seep. The white deposits indicate that the water is likely salty, and the brown and black areas appear to show some presence of oil. The oil seeps in the southern part of Humboldt County are very remote and difficult to get to. The area includes the westernmost point in the lower 48 states. Similar to Calusa County, most of the oil and gas seeps in the area were on private property and located behind fences, and we were not able to visit them. There were several oil seeps mapped on a place called Black Sand Beach. Unfortunately, the oil seeps that had been mapped along the wave cut outcrops along the beach had all been covered over the years by sediments eroded uphill and deposited annually during winter storms. Public access to lands with oil and gas seeps is continually being reduced. An example is this locked gate closing off access to the felt springs near the town of Fortuna that includes natural gas seeps. California is also home to numerous offshore oil and gas seeps. For example, this map published by the USGS shows numerous gas seeps, gas vent craters, and water column anomalies offshore the central coast of California near Santa Maria. This satellite photo published by NASA shows that sometimes the natural oil seeps cause huge oil slicks that can be seen from space in the Santa Barbara Channel. About 15 years ago, a team of scientists at UC Santa Barbara discovered underwater asphalt volcanoes at the location of some of the seeps in the Santa Barbara Channel. The discovery was based on some three-dimensional mapping of the seafloor. Since the discovery of the underwater asphalt volcanoes, the processes associated with their formation continue to be studied and better understood. Recent research has discovered that underwater ecosystems are thriving around the underwater asphalt volcanoes. Biodegradation of the oil seeps supports a wide variety of species, as shown in this close-up photo. The first record of California oil being used by man was made nearly 500 years ago, in 1542, by explorer Juan Cabrillo. Cabrillo noted that the local Chumash tribe was using asphalt to seal the planks on their ocean-going canoes. The town of Carpinteria was named in 1769 by soldiers within the Portola expedition. The name was Spanish for the carpenter shop, 
based on the many wooden boats being built at the location. The Chumash canoes were very seaworthy due to the tar used to seal the wooden blanks. Without making use of the oil seeps, the Chumash would have never been able to reach the Channel Islands and create settlements out there. The name for a Chumash canoe was Tomal. Chumash elder Fernando Labrado oversaw construction of this Tomal in 1914. Fernando's parents were from two different villages on Santa Cruz Island. His parents were brought to Mission San Buenaventura as children. Fernando was born at Mission San Buenaventura in 1839. Native Americans relied on asphalt from oil seeps for many different purposes. For example, it was used to seal and waterproof water containers made by weaving grass. It was used like glue in the construction of tools and weapons. And it was used as a sealant, for example, to plug these holes in this abalone shell to make a nice dish. California's population density increased drastically following the discovery of gold by James Marshall at Sutter's Mill in 1848. Ships became stranded in San Francisco as the crews joined the gold rush. After a few years, things returned to normal and clipper ships became a big part of the supply chain to California from eastern ports. In 1855, a lot of whale oil was being purchased to light up the mining camps across the gold country. During the gold rush, many people who created sustained wealth were the merchants. For example, this page from the 1852 census for the city of Sacramento includes the names of three brothers who operated a grocery store. The grocery store was run by the Stanford brothers who came from New York during the gold rush. At age 35, Josiah was the oldest brother. Charles was the second oldest brother at age 33. Asa Phillips was the youngest brother at age 30. Younger brother Leland Stanford was 28 at the time. Leland was admitted to the bar in New York in 1848 and moved with other settlers to Wisconsin at the time. In 1852, he lost his law library to a fire and ended up following his brothers to California during the gold rush. Leland achieved great business and political success in California. In 1861, Leland founded the Central Pacific Railroad with four others. Leland was elected governor of California in 1861 and served one term. In 1869, the Central Pacific Railroad met up with the Union Pacific Railroad at Promontory Point in Utah to become the first transcontinental railroad. Leland was given the honor of driving the final spike. In 1885, Leland was elected to the United States Senate, where he served until his death in 1893. And also in 1885, he and his wife founded Stanford University. In the 1850s, the Stanford brothers established the Pacific Oil and Camphene Works in the port city of San Francisco. In the late 1850s, camphene was a trade name for the most popular lamp fuel. Turpentine was distilled and mixed with alcohol, and camphor was added for a nice aroma. The Stanford brothers also supplied lamp fuels made from animals. Polar oil was made from walruses and seals. Lard oil was rendered from beef fat. Sperm oil was from sperm whales, and elephant oil was rendered from elephant fat. The Stanford Brothers had a large branch store on Front Street in Sacramento that still stands in the historical district. The Stanford Brothers Pacific Oil and Camphene Works plant also supplied several other Stanford Brothers stores throughout the gold country. The lamp fuel industry was disrupted in a major way in 1859. That's when Edwin Drake drilled the first commercial oil well, shown here in Titusville, Pennsylvania. Shortly after Drake's well was drilled, chemists figured out how to distill kerosene from the crude oil. A cartoon from the time shows whales celebrating the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania. By 1861, the Stanford brothers were supplying kerosene as a lamp fuel to their customers. By 1865, 
Drilling methods established in Pennsylvania were being documented in books, and capitalists were bringing experts to California. In 1865, ads started appearing in California newspapers placed by promoters. The promoters sought to sign leases and promised to deliver capital, equipment, and expertise to develop the oil resources. One type of expert mentioned in the California papers in the 1860s was the oil smeller. Oil smellers professed to ascertain the proper spot for drilling wells by smelling the earth. The profession of oil smelling has not withstood the test of time. Today, it has largely been replaced by the profession of geology. In 1865, some oil samples were shipped from Humboldt County to San Francisco to be tested. At that time, the future of the California oil industry was still unknown. Some historic California oil wells are memorialized by this plaque located in Petrolia in Humboldt County. The wells were located on the North Fork of the Matol River, three miles east of the plaque. In 1865, it was reported that the first native California petroleum refined was from Humboldt County and was refined by the Stanford brothers at their San Francisco refinery. This photograph from 1935 shows oil being baled from one of the historic Union Matol Oil Company wells. During the 1860s, California newspapers reported oil exploration occurring at oil seeps all across the state. For example, there was the Sargent Ranch in Monterey County. A seep was reported along the Kern River in Tulare County, later to be carved out to become Kern County. There was seeps reported near Buena Vista Lake, near the southern end of Tulare County, later to be carved out to become Kern County. And there were oil and gas seeps reported in Calusa County. The Stanford brothers had commercial success in constructing a tunnel to produce oil from the ground near the seeps in Ventura County. This cross-section shows how a mirror was used to reflect sunlight to keep the tunnel straight as it was constructed into the side of the mountain. Chinese laborers experienced with tunneling for the Central Pacific Railroad were used to construct the tunnel. In 1866, Drilling near oil seeps was reported at Wiley Springs, Moore Spring, Pico Spring, and then the Stanford Tunnel in Ventura County was reported as producing about 10 barrels a day. In the 1800s, based on surface conditions, over 30 counties in California thought that they would have future oil development within their boundaries. Oil production growth in California was delayed by the Panic of 1873 and the subsequent Depression. Oil production grew in California from about 30 barrels a day in 1876 to over 7,000 barrels a day by 1899. Based on snowballing reports of oil discoveries in the newspapers, by 1901, Californians knew that the future of the oil industry in their state was going to be great. Despite early hopes, the oil potential in some counties did not pan out. Oil development became concentrated in certain parts of the state, and oil production continued to grow. Electricity disrupted the lighting industry as the light bulb replaced kerosene lamps. However, demand for crude oil continued to surge as it replaced coal as an energy source. As the Navy switched from coal to oil to power their ships, they set up naval petroleum reserves, including the Elk Hills oil field in California. Demand for crude oil in California was further increased due to the disruption to the transportation industry brought by the development of the internal combustion engine. This chart shows global primary energy consumption by source from 1800 to 2020. The chart shows the Drake well in 1859, and the chart notes that the use of coal continued to increase due to its use as a fuel for electrical power plants. This chart shows that fossil fuels, coal, crude oil, and natural gas make up the largest component of world energy consumption. Global crude oil consumption has grown to an all-time high of about 100 million barrels per day. Some forecasts show global oil production remaining at this level for 20 years or more. California oil production continued to increase through the 1900s. 
During World War II, the California oil industry was called upon to supply military ships and planes in the Pacific and Southeast Asia. To support the war effort, California production was ramped up to an all-time high of nearly 1 million barrels a day. Oil production began increasing in California again in the 1960s when thermal-enhanced oil recovery with steam injection was introduced. The oil production rate for California peaked at about 1.1 million barrels per day in 1986. The maps show oil fields in the San Joaquin Basin on the left and the Los Angeles Basin on the right. These two oil basins may be the juiciest in the world in terms of amount of oil per unit rock volume. This chart shows four waves of energy transitions beginning in the 1800s. The first transition was the introduction of the use of coal in the 1800s. Coal-fired steam boilers powered trains and factories. The second energy transition was the adoption of crude oil as an energy source. The third energy transition was the adoption of natural gas as an energy source. And now, the world is in the middle of the fourth energy transition, the adoption of renewable energy, mostly in the form of wind and solar electricity. As about 80% of the world's energy supply is fossil fuels, the transition to renewables will take a while for the world. Looking at the science of oil formation starts with geology. Geology starts with a discussion of plate tectonics. The reason that some continents look like they fit together like a jigsaw puzzle is because they actually do. The theory of plate tectonics explains how the continents across the world have moved around over millions of years. This cross-section shows how it works. Underwater in the oceans, there are oceanic ridges where the volcanic rock surfaces, and then spreads. Over millions of years, the seafloor continues to spread outward and eventually hits a continent and then goes into a subduction zone. If there is not a subduction zone, the continent can get pushed around. For example, India crashed into Asia, and that's how the Himalayan mountains were formed. In North America, the Cascadia subduction zone creates the Cascade volcanoes in the state of Washington and Oregon. The volcanoes form when the material being subducted under the continent goes deeper, gets really hot, and then floats to the surface in the form of a volcano. The Sierra Nevada mountains in California were formed in a similar manner. However, the subduction zone is no longer active. For California, the spreading ridge is in the Gulf of California in Mexico. The northward push from that spreading ridge is the cause behind the San Andreas transverse fault that bisects California. There are three main types of rocks, igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. Spreading ridges and volcanoes are forms of igneous rock. Igneous rocks are crystalline, dense, have low porosity, and do not have any organic material. This volcano is California's Mount Lassen, which last erupted in 1915. This igneous basalt is located at Devil's Postpile National Monument, located just to the east of California's Yosemite National Park. This is a look at the Kern River in California. Geologic deposition in rivers is a form of sedimentary rock. Grain size of the sedimentary rock depends on the velocity of the moving water. It can range from boulders, such as seen here in the Kern River, to silt and clay sized grains as formed in this delta in a California reservoir during a flood event. Low velocity deposition in deep water results in finely laminated shale and clay layers as shown in this outcrop from the eastern United States. Cross-bedded sandstones can be found in sedimentary rocks that were deposited either in beaches, rivers, or even by wind in sand dunes. Metamorphic rocks are formed when sedimentary rocks are recrystallized due to increased pressure and or temperature. This can happen based on depth of burial and or proximity to an intrusive volcanic rock. This slate outcrop was formed from recrystallization of sedimentary shale rock. Marble is another type of metamorphic rock. Metamorphic recrystallization of sedimentary limestone formed the marble that was mined at this quarry in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. Crude oil is formed in sedimentary rocks. Dead plants and animals that get buried by other sediments are a form of sedimentation. 
the largest mass of organic material that gets converted to crude oil in the earth is from phytoplankton. Despite their extremely small sizes, the source of most of the organic material that has been deposited on the ocean floor that has been converted to crude oil by the earth is from phytoplankton. Just like trees and plants, phytoplankton rely on photosynthesis for energy. Phytoplankton use sunlight to convert water and carbon dioxide to glucose and oxygen. Glucose from phytoplankton becomes the organic material that the earth converts into crude oil through a natural process. Over millions of years, waves of plankton blooms get buried between mud layers on the seafloor. The layers rich in plankton become the rich organic shale over time. Depending on the depth of burial and the pressure and temperature, fresh organic material can get converted to kerogen and then crude oil and then dry gas. After crude oil is formed deep in the earth, it can migrate upward. The migration can be caused by pressure and or buoyancy due to the force of gravity. Much of the crude oil in the earth is not trapped within commercial reservoirs. Much of the crude oil and gas in the earth is left behind in non-commercial volumes along the migration pathways. Oil and or gas can also be found trapped in small non-commercial accumulations. And finally, some of the generated oil and gas can reach the surface of the earth in the form of a natural oil or gas seep. In California, all oil and gas wells drilled in the state are regulated by a single state agency and one set of regulations. On the other hand, drilling and reporting requirements for water wells are regulated locally by county agencies in California. This discrepancy between oil well reporting requirements and water well reporting requirements in California likely ends up in underreporting of the occurrence of oil and gas throughout the state. Oil and gas seeps can reach the surface either directly through a permeable bed, through faults or fractures, and or through unconformity layers. It should be noted that the disruption that's hit the American oil industry has largely bypassed California. 30 years ago, the American oil and gas industry figured out how to get oil and gas out of organic shale source rock. The reason that this disrupted the American energy industry is because the shale resource is enormous and the technical risk with drilling and completing the wells and putting them on production is very low. The breakthrough technology involves drilling horizontal wells into shale beds and performing multiple stages of hydraulic fractures. Shale reservoirs like this are now known as unconventional resources. The oil is recovered directly out of the source beds before the oil has even migrated. Prior to this, all oil development was for conventional resources, which involved migration of oil and accumulation in porous traps underground. The best unconventional oil resources are located in Texas, and that's where the big oil companies have concentrated most of their capital investment. California has very rich organic shales serving as source rock. However, so far, attempts to produce oil directly from the source rocks before migration have proven uncommercial in California.